Chapter 101, Level 4 Alchemy and Hermione's Invitation Inside the Johnny Silverhand store, John stood in his cauldron room, a sense of accomplishment washing over him. Alchemy has finally been upgraded, he announced, setting down the necklace he had been holding. This particular piece, an obsidian-like necklace, was part of the Johnny Silverhand series. Named the Silent Heart, its primary function was to shield its wearer from external probing while simultaneously preventing their inner thoughts from being transmitted. This very necklace had played a crucial role during their covert operation at Shafiq Manor. However, the Silent Heart had its drawbacks. After each use, its pendant required replacement. This pendant, a rudimentary version of the Magic Remnant Stone, was a flawed product John had crafted based on instructions from Nicole Flamel's handbook. Its sole purpose was to store and release magical power with the real essence of the Silent Heart residing in its chain. Level 3 alchemy was insufficient for refining the Sorcerer's Stone. Now, with an upgrade, I should be able to enhance the version, John mused. He had committed Nicole Flamel's teachings to memory, understanding that mastering these complex concepts would further his alchemical skills. Flamel had generously shared his knowledge, aiming to shield John from undue attention and discourage him from becoming overly fixated on his legacy. In John's eyes, Nicole Flamel was more than a mentor, he was a guiding light. Intent on fulfilling his role as Flamel's successor, John set to work on crafting his version of the Sorcerer's Stone. After some effort, he produced a stone the size of a lavender pigeon egg, which he decided to call the Magic Crystal. Unlike the legendary Philosopher's Stone, this magic crystal couldn't concoct the elixir of life, but it could mimic some of its other remarkable abilities. Holding the magic crystal in one hand and a spoon in the other, John focused intently. Gradually, the spoon transformed, taking on a golden sheen until it was indistinguishable from real gold. Upon examining the newly gold spoon, John found it to be a perfect replica. The magic crystal, however, had darkened slightly, indicating it had expended about a tenth of its power. If this were the Philosopher's Stone, such a power expenditure would be trivial. It seems further improvements are necessary, John concluded, storing the magic crystal away and tossing the golden spoon into a drawer. He contemplated using his points to immediately upgrade his alchemy level further, but decided against it, fearing potential instability. It's better to wait until my current level is fully consolidated, he reasoned. After leaving the cauldron room, John briefed Tang Mi on some tasks before casting a disillusionment spell and exiting the Johnny Silverhand store. Meanwhile, the Wicks had been staying in London for nearly a week. Initially, Papa Watson Wick and Mr. Granger bonded over golf, but their friendship quickly deepened, leading to an unexpected turn of events. On the third day, after enjoying some wine by the river, Mr. Watson and Mr. Granger encountered a young woman from the clinic. In a moment of inebriated judgment, they accepted her invitation for a drink. However, their outing was cut short when Mrs. Wick and Mrs. Granger, having baked together and formed their own bond, arrived on the scene. The confrontation was dramatic, with Watson's newly fitted ceramic teeth nearly becoming a casualty. In a bid to protect his friend, Watson bravely took the blame, asserting that the young woman had been there to see him. This act of loyalty infuriated Mrs. Wick, who was already preparing to address the situation. Mr. Granger, witnessing Watson's sacrifice, was deeply moved by his friend's gesture. Loyalty bound them, and as they exchanged affectionate glances, a classic saying from the Celestial Dynasty echoed in their minds, Do not wish to be born on the same day of the same month of the same year, but to die on the same day of the same month of the same year. It was as if the theme song of their friendship played in the background, celebrating the joy of finding a true friend in each other, much like the way peach blossoms bloom brightly in honor of such a bond. The story took an unexpected turn when Mr. Granger revealed a humorous mishap. He confessed that his wife's relentless pursuit and three determined visits to the clinic had driven Mrs. Granger to the brink. The situation escalated into a comical chase, resulting in both Mr. Granger and his friend being accidentally struck by a toy car. This minor accident led to a dramatic fall down some steps, and they ended up in the hospital, their injuries bonding them further. The hospital stay cooled down the tempers of their wives, 
and the two men, now wary of further mischief, decided to steer clear of any more trouble. Amidst the chaos, the young woman involved managed to slip away, leaving the incident unresolved. John returned to his father's apartment, a modest place provided by the company his father worked for. Despite his unassuming appearance, his father was considered an elite within the company. Upon entering, John found his father, Watson, struggling to open the refrigerator for a beer. John, seizing the beer, left Watson, lamenting his fate. Watson, now sober and feeling sorry for himself, remembered Mrs. Wick's warning that if he didn't behave, she would entrust his care to Andre, one of John's uncles known for his formidable strength and intimidating presence. Just then, a knock on the door interrupted Watson's thoughts. Expecting his friend Mr. Granger, he was surprised to find Hermione Granger instead, looking for John. Hermione, usually seen with a book in hand, had opted for casual attire this time. Watson, with a hint of mischief, informed her that John was available. Hermione invited John to go out, marking the first time she had asked a wizard classmate to join her outside of school activities. John, having no other plans, accepted. To his surprise, Hermione led him to a park, a place devoid of magic and wizards, a setting that felt strangely unfamiliar to John after his time at Hogwarts. As they walked, Hermione shared that the park was a place she often visited, a place where she felt most at ease despite feeling unwelcome elsewhere. John realized that Hermione, much like himself, had faced challenges in fitting in. He remembered how even Harry and Ron had initially been wary of Hermione. Yet over time, John had become Hermione's first friend at Hogwarts, a bond she cherished deeply. Hermione had always stood by John, even when others doubted him, showing a level of care and loyalty that went beyond mere friendship. As they reached a swing set, Hermione hesitated, hoping John would push her on the swing. Instead, she found him already enjoying himself on another swing. Watching him, a mix of amusement and fondness crossed her face. After a moment of contemplation, she joined him, embracing the simple joy of the moment, a testament to their unique and enduring friendship. For a considerable time, Hermione harbored a question that she couldn't suppress any longer. John, why did you decide to befriend me? She inquired. Their initial encounter was anything but cordial. John, who had been swinging high into the air at the time, responded with a nonchalance that belied the depth of his answer. Friendship is all about the connection of feelings. Hermione felt a twinge of sadness at his words. Was it merely a matter of feeling that led him to comment on her prominent teeth? Lately, Hermione had been wrestling with a sense of inadequacy, especially when she considered her inability to assist Harry in the same daring manner as Ron, who had the adventure of rescuing Harry from the Dursleys with a flying car. Her contributions seemed to pale in comparison, and it weighed heavily on her. Noticing her dispirited mood, John alighted from the swing and approached her with a gravity that was uncharacteristic of their previous exchanges. Hermione, it's crucial that you confront your true self. You possess a heart that's both noble and courageous, complemented by a boundless intellect, he asserted with sincerity. Our friendship isn't predicated on grand gestures of sacrifice, but on the profound connection between our hearts. John's earnest reassurance lifted the cloud of gloom that had settled over Hermione. Thank you, John, she expressed, her spirits buoyed by his words. When she looked up to meet his gaze, she found that he had already wandered over to the ice cream truck parked by the roadside. He glanced back at her, an ice cream cone already in hand, and inquired about her preferred flavor. Caught slightly off guard by the swift change in topic, Hermione replied after a brief pause, I'd like strawberry, please. Chapter 1 or 2, The Ice Cream Treat Should I exchange some money? John pondered, looking at the few pounds in his hand. It seemed almost comical that he, Tang Tang Johnny Yin Show, nearly found himself short of cash. It was July when John returned to Privet Drive, stopping by the Dursley's residence. Upon seeing John, Vernon Dursley was rendered speechless, while Dudley, stricken with fear, quickly sought refuge. John, feigning ignorance of their discomfort, presented Vernon with a large watermelon he had purchased. Is Harry upstairs? Sorry to disturb you, John inquired politely. Given John's courteous demeanor, Vernon had no choice but to grudgingly respond, Yes, he's up there, while eyeing John warily, 
contemplating when he might rid himself of John's presence. Since John's last warning, the Dursleys had eased their harsh treatment of Harry. Though they occasionally uttered a few harsh words, they dared not confine him as before. Ascending the stairs, John heard murmurs from within. Harry was engrossed in a history of magic essay when John knocked and entered. Harry, surprised by John's visit, had sought him earlier, only to find John in Nocturne Alley at the time. Harry, would you like some ice cream? John offered, producing a boxed ice cream from his bag. Harry, taken aback, accepted it, puzzled. Did you come just to bring me ice cream? Of course not, Snack. John replied with a smirk, dismissing the notion of being so superficial. With a casual wave of his hand, he closed the door, a gesture that left Harry in awe. Despite knowing the gap in their magical abilities, Harry hadn't realized it was so vast. He was still mastering spellcasting with a wand, while John could effortlessly cast spells without one. John then retrieved two gloves from his bag and donned them. What are you planning to do? Harry inquired, noting John's prepared stance. You mentioned your wound was bothering you last time. I want to examine it, John explained. Unbeknownst to others, John was acutely aware of the significance of Harry's scar. As the seventh Horcrux, Harry harbored a fragment of Voldemort's soul. John had encountered extensive literature on the soul in both the Slytherin and Gryffindor Chambers of Secrets. The soul, a complex entity, had been a subject of diverse research among wizards. Although now taboo, soul studies were not uncommon in the past. Equipped with anti-curse gloves, John gently probed Harry's scar, a scene that Harry found somewhat amusing yet rendered him helpless. John's enthusiasm seemed excessive to Harry, who had only mentioned his discomfort in passing. As Harry savored his ice cream, John meticulously examined the scar, confirming the presence of a potent spell more akin to a curse. Could it be because of love? John pondered. The spell of love that protected Harry was a marvel, impervious even to Voldemort. It shielded Harry, causing Quirrell to burn upon contact. John, are you okay? Harry asked, noticing John's deep contemplation and fearing to move as his ice cream nearly melted. If you cut it, John mused aloud, startling Harry into a cold sweat. Calm down, John. I'm not a lab rat. Okay. John conceded, albeit somewhat disappointed. Understanding the structure of the Horcrux could potentially offer a means to counter Voldemort. If you're in pain again, just let me know, he offered, concerned about Harry's well-being. Harry nodded eagerly, relieved that John had abandoned any drastic measures. Upon returning home, John set about crafting new weapons, acquiring a plethora of equipment for the task. He melted silver sickles mixed with mithril, crafting a sword of sterling silver that floated in the air, a testament to his skill and determination to protect those he cared about. In the basement, John was engrossed in his work, manipulating silver liquid and blending it with various metals. After some time, the blade, now cooled, was polished meticulously by John. He then took out dragon's blood to engrave intricate patterns onto the blade. The sword of iron wick was previously core, oded by snake venom. After refining it, I've managed to infuse the blade with the venom, John explained. He had disassembled Ironwick's sword and incorporated these materials into it, significantly increasing the blade's weight. Casting a spell to re-engrave the sword, he watched as flames engulfed it. Despite the high temperature, the silver sword remained intact, a testament to John's successful enhancement. It may not rival the sword of Gryffindor, but it's a magical item in its own right, he mused. After inspecting his work, John left some space on the sword for future spell additions, effectively upgrading Ironwick's sword in every aspect. I'll name you Silver Wick, he declared, satisfied with his creation, and placed the sword into a small bag. This bag, a masterpiece from a master alchemist, featured a stable traceless stretching spell and offered ample space. That night, John donned a silver mask and a green robe. With a flick of his wand, he disappeared, reappearing in Nocturne Alley through Apparition, which greatly facilitated his movements. Tang Mi was already there, accompanied by a stooped old man. Upon John's arrival, the old man, trembling with excitement, seemed on the verge of kneeling. John's gaze shifted to Tang Mi for an explanation. My lord, this is old Jack from the werewolf community. He's come seeking your help, Tang Mi introduced. John recalled Fenrir, the former leader of the werewolf community, whom he had dealt with previously. State your request, 
John commanded in a deep voice. With a raspy voice, Old Jack said, Respected Your Excellency Johnny Silverhand, we seek your protection. After Fenrir's downfall, the werewolves scattered, leaving behind the old, weak, and sick among us. John learned that following his confrontation with Fenrir, the werewolf community had disintegrated, leaving its most vulnerable members at the mercy of a dark wizard intent on their destruction. In desperation, they turned to John, the very person responsible for their plight. After confirming the truth of Old Jack's words with Tang Mi, John responded, I will grant your request for help. In return, you must ensure the werewolf community is well managed. Recognizing the potential in guiding the young werewolves properly, John saw an opportunity to harness a powerful force for the future. Overjoyed, Old Jack expressed his gratitude, hoping for Merlin's blessing upon John. Days later, the werewolf community witnessed the demise of the Dark Wizard threatening them, marked by the emblem of Johnny Silverhand. This act, along with John's provision of Wolfsbane Potion to the young werewolves, alleviated their suffering during the full moon and solidified Johnny Silverhand's reputation as a protector. Even the Daily Prophet sought an exclusive interview with him, with Rita Skeeter as the reporter. John, wary of her penchant for sensationalism, warned her against any misleading rhetoric. The resulting article, titled Johnny Silverhand, The Great Good Man, showcased a different side of John, further enhancing his standing in the wizarding world. In a recent publication, the newspaper featured an article highlighting Johnny Silverhand's aspiration for global harmony and his desire to see an end to the suffering of young wizards due to hunger. It was rumored that Rita Skeeter even proposed to the editor-in-chief that Johnny Silverhand be honored with the annual Great Benefactor Award. However, the suggestion was ultimately declined by the editor-in-chief. Chapter 103, Level 4 Runes and Ancient Magic The owl thudded against the window, a clear indication of its arrival. Recognizing it as the old Weasley family owl, without a moment's hesitation, John swiftly opened the window and gently lifted the bird, retrieving the letter from its beak. Traveling to Egypt, he murmured, scanning the letter. Ron had written to inform John that their family was planning a trip to Egypt, expressing regret that the invitation to the borough would have to be postponed. I would have completely forgotten about it if he hadn't mentioned it. Ron had extended an invitation to John during their second year, but amidst the chaos of returning home and his experiments with Banbon, John had let it slip his mind, assuming Ron wouldn't extend the offer again. Percy's letter followed, filled with gratitude towards John for aiding in his election as student council president. He also hinted at his aspirations to work in the Ministry of Magic in the future. It seems he set his sights on the Ministry of Magic. I remember him doing quite well there, John reflected. Percy, an outlier in the Weasley family, had always been ambitious, methodically climbing the ranks from prefect to head boy, and now aiming for a position in the ministry. With a smile, John thought, in that case, I'm more than happy to assist. He penned a letter to Barty Crouch Sr., a man he had come to respect deeply for his uncompromising principles, even when it came to dealing with his own kin. John believed Percy would benefit greatly from working under someone like Crouch. After sorting through his daily correspondence, John picked up the latest issue of the Daily Prophet. The controversy surrounding Johnny Silverhand had begun to settle, and the opening of a museum dedicated to dark magic awareness suggested Silverhand wasn't the typical power-hungry dark wizard. Today's front page featured Gilderoy Lockhart, who had been awarded the title of Most Charming Smile by Wizards Weekly for the sixth consecutive year. The paper also covered the success of Lockhart's latest book, I Swing the Great Sword at Hogwarts, which had quickly become a bestseller in the wizarding world. John had to admit, Lockhart possessed a unique talent. As long as his true nature remained hidden, he was indeed the magic world's leading figure. The book's innovative approach, featuring two protagonists, a dashing, powerful professor and a gifted Hogwarts student, along with its loosely factual content, had captivated readers. It's a masterpiece in its own right, John conceded, considering the potential of further collaborations with Lockhart. Seeing an opportunity, John drafted a letter to Rita Skeeter, confident that with the backing of the Daily Prophet, 
Lockhart's success could be sustained. Behind the scenes, John planned to fuel the fire, not without personal gain, of course. He intended to secure the copyright for Silverhand Johnny, with profits to be split between himself and Lockhart. Properly managed, this venture could prove quite lucrative for John. Descending to the basement, which had become his personal domain, filled with dangerous artifacts securely locked away, John reflected on his day's achievements. His mastery of runes had advanced to level four, allowing him to fully comprehend the contents of Fairy Foundry. The goblin's unique magical forging techniques, detailed within the pages, were nothing short of miraculous. Fairy magic, John mused, intrigued by the ancient and powerful goblin magic laid out before him. John was deep in contemplation. The magic he was studying was known as ancient magic, a form of magic that predated even the era of the Hogwarts founders, back to a time when goblins were not yet governed by wizards. Unlike the wand-based magic commonly practiced by wizards, leprechaun magic, another form of ancient magic, was innate and did not rely on wands. It's no surprise that ancient runes are considered a part of ancient magic, given their necessity, John mused, after delving into the knowledge contained with Hin the ancient tome. Intent on mastering this arcane art, John attempted to replicate the goblin method of casting. To harness the elements and channel them into objects, creating a natural magic circuit, he whispered to himself. With a magic crystal in hand and his arms extended forward, he focused his mind. Suddenly, a whirlwind materialized in the confines of the basement, seemingly out of nowhere. The element of wind, he observed, his gaze fixed on the swirling vortex. Maintaining his concentration, John manipulated the whirlwind, guiding it towards a ring of spells etched on the table. As the wind made contact, the spell was activated, narrowly missing John's cheek with a petrification curse. The wind dissipated immediately after. It appears further experimentation is necessary, John concluded, his brow furrowed in thought. The complexity of the fairy foundry and its reliance on ancient magic was daunting. John pondered whether seeking a goblin's craftsmanship, much like Godric Gryffindor once did, would be simpler. However, he quickly realized the futility of this idea, considering the current state of goblin affairs and their concentration in Gringotts. The craftsmanship of the goblin king who forged Gryffindor's sword is beyond the skill of ordinary goblins, he acknowledged with a sigh. Resigned, he muttered, I must rely on my own abilities. Glancing at the skill panel, John noticed he had two unused points and a new skill labeled Proficient in Ancient Magic. Although it was only at level one and could not be upgraded further at the moment, it signified a need for deeper knowledge in ancient magic. To advance further, I must delve deeper into the study of ancient magic, he realized, acknowledging his limited understanding of the subject. Setting aside his immediate concerns, John dedicated himself to comprehensively studying the fairy foundry. His expertise in alchemy and runes made the book's content accessible, though he found its coverage of goblin casting techniques lacking. I may need to explore other sources, he thought, considering the restricted section of the library and the secret chambers of the ancient wizards as potential reservoirs of knowledge. In the days that followed, John remained secluded in his basement, mastering the elemental magics of fog, water, and fire, in addition to wind. Each element offered unique advantages, wind-enhanced perception, Fog concealed his presence, water manipulated flows, and fire conjured flames. The ability to wield these magics without a wand was a significant achievement for John. Tom, do a backflip, John commanded, watching his dog perform the trick with ease. Remarkable, how did you manage to train him? A visitor, a business associate of John's guardian, inquired, clearly impressed. It's nothing special, just the basics, John replied modestly. The visitor had brought along his child, hoping to foster a friendship between the two boys. However, John found the child's arrogance unbearable, preferring the company of his dog, Tom, to feigning interest in childish conversations. Seeking solace, John excused himself, craving the fresh air outside. Ah, the sweet taste of freedom, John sighed, relieved to be away from the stifling atmosphere. He vowed to avoid such tedious social obligations in the future, finding them more taxing than his most challenging negotiations. Even Draco Malfoy seems more tolerable in comparison, he mused, reflecting on the nature of spoiled children, 
and his desire to steer clear of them. With no particular destination in mind, John wandered aimlessly, enjoying the peace and solitude of his impromptu escape. On the side of the road, John stumbled upon a black dog. The dog appeared to have been starving for days. Even beneath its thick fur, John could discern the dog's emaciated frame. He acknowledged that the dog wasn't particularly attractive, but as someone who couldn't resist the allure of furry creatures, John couldn't help but offer a pack of small dried fish. Have you been hungry for a lawn? Gee time, he asked. The black dog, which had been staring off into the distance, seemed momentarily taken aback by the sound of John's voice. A dark-haired boy was offering him small dried fish, an unusual choice for a canine diet. However, driven by hunger, the dog didn't hesitate to accept the offering. Watching the dog devour the fish, John felt a pang of sympathy. Gently patting the dog's head, John mused aloud, I wonder where you came from. Stray dogs aren't common around here. Despite its unkempt appearance, the dog's coat was surprisingly soft and well-maintained. John found himself enjoying the sensation of petting the dog, so much so that he failed to notice the dog's bewildered gaze. This encounter marked the beginning of an unusual friendship, one that would soon reveal the black dog's extraordinary origins. Unbeknownst to John, this was no ordinary stray, but a creature steeped in magic and mystery. Chapter 104, Stardust and the Godfather. After the house guests finally departed, Tom, the family dog, was visibly exhausted, his fur slightly ruffled from the day's events. A young visitor had been particularly rough with Tom, attempting to take him away despite his parents' offers to compensate for any trouble caused. Mrs. Wick, however, managed to scare the child off with a deceptively kind smile, all the while brandishing a table knife with an ease that would make even Watson hesitate. Upon John's return, Tom's spirits instantly lifted, though confusion flickered in his eyes as he approached. Abruptly stopping, Tom sniffed around John, his demeanor suggesting betrayal. It was as if Tom could detect the scent of another dog on John. Despite Tom's apparent jealousy, John reassured him with a laugh. It was nothing serious, just a bit of fun. I promise, I won't bring another dog home. Tom's wagging tail soon betrayed his lingering doubts, quickly placated by a generous serving of dog food. Meanwhile, a snowy owl perched atop a cabinet caught John's attention with its hungry calls. Where have you been hiding? John mused, offering the owl some dried fish. As he turned to the attic room, he was greeted by the sight of another snowy owl, identical to the first. You're Basil. Then who is this? John pondered, holding the newcomer. The two owls, upon closer inspection, began to show signs of rivalry, leading to a brief scuffle that John diffused with more dried fish. Outside, John noticed the large black dog still loitering near the road, pondering if it had an owner. His attention was soon diverted back to the owls, now identified as Basil and Hedwig, Harry Potter's own pet. The revelation came just as Harry appeared, searching for Hedwig. John called out to him, and a relieved Harry rushed over, greeted warmly by Mrs. Wick's elegant presence. Inside, Watson Wick, reminiscing about his days as a driver in Canary Wharf, made an unusual request to Harry. He asked, in hushed tones, if Harry could turn a teacup into a mouse, promising to keep it a secret. Harry, taken aback by the request and the implication of his abilities, politely declined, citing the prohibition of underage magic outside school. Watson's surprise at this rule hinted at his own son's magical experiments at home. The Wicks' attic, where John resided, was a stark contrast to Harry's cupboard at the Dursleys. Spacious and filled with kennels and bird cages, it resembled a small zoo, a testament to the Wicks' love for animals and the magical world intertwined with their own. To ensure John didn't stand out too much among them, Hedwig was given a piece of dried fish for which Harry expressed his gratitude repeatedly. John noticed the absence of the large black dog that had been outside, presuming it had left. Seizing the moment, John mentioned, Since you're here, I have your birthday present ready. He gestured towards a wrapped gift box on the table and handed it to Harry. Harry, taken aback by the gesture, eagerly asked, May I open it? Of course it's yours, John replied, feeding Hedwig another small piece of dried fish, noting the owl must have been famished after its long flight. Curiously, Harry unwrapped the gift to find a bottle filled with a black powdery substance. As he shook it, 
the powder inside fluttered like a constellation of stars in motion, a sight he had never witnessed before. What is this? he inquired, fascinated. It's an anti-eavesdropping powder. Sprinkle it around, and it will alert you to any snooping, John explained. Demonstrating its use, he took a pinch of the powder and tossed it into the air, where it drifted and adhered to the door. At that moment, John called out, Dad, were you planning to bring us some drinks? Watson, caught eavesdropping behind the door, entered sheepishly with drinks before quickly excusing himself. John, with a shrug, remarked, See? Just like that. Harry's eyes sparkled with excitement as he held the bottle, already thinking of the relief of not having to worry about Uncle Vernonov or hearing him anymore. What's it called? he asked. John, realizing he hadn't named the powder yet, replied offhandedly, Let's call it Stardust. In August, John ventured to Diagon Alley, adopting a low profile as Johnny Silver Hand, a name that had become synonymous with mystery. He visited a divination shop and purchased a crystal ball filled with swirling white mist. Despite several attempts, John couldn't trigger any prophecies, leading him to conclude, divination is not as straightforward as it seems. He whimsically used the crystal ball as a paperweight in his office. When Lucius Malfoy and his son Draco visited, John was taken aback by their unexpected arrival. Draco, visibly tense, seemed inexperienced in dealing with the enigmatic Johnny Silver Hand. Lucius, however, approached with a congenial smile, expressing his pleasure at reuniting after some time. He introduced his son, Draco, who respectfully greeted John as, Your Excellency Johnny Silver Hand. John was puzzled by their visit until Lucius revealed his intention, smiling warmly. I would be honored if my son could become the godson of Your Excellency Johnny Silver Hand. John was astounded by the request. If he weren't wearing a mask, his surprise would have been evident. The idea of becoming Draco's godfather was bewildering to him, especially considering they were classmates. The thought of navigating their future interactions under such a peculiar dynamic was perplexing. Yet, John also grasped Lucius's underlying motive. By proposing this relationship, Lucius sought to align his family more closely with Johnny Silverhand's influential reputation, hoping to leverage it for their benefit. To further solidify the bond between their families, Lucius Malfoy sought a deeper connection than mere friendship with John. He believed that having John as a godfather to his son would bring the families closer, offering a more intimate and reassuring relationship to the Malfoys. However, John's response was not what Lucius had anticipated. I understand your intentions, Lucius, John began, his voice carrying a weight of seriousness. But there's something fundamentally wrong with this proposal. Lucius was taken aback by John's refusal. He had not expected resistance, especially considering the importance he had placed on this alliance for the future of the Malfoy family. Draco, who had been informed by his father of John's significance, felt a wave of disappointment. Your Excellency Johnny Silverhand, Draco is a commendable young man, Lucius attempted to persuade. I know Lucius, perhaps even better than you do, John countered his statement leaving Lucius puzzled. How could Johnny Silverhand claim to know Draco better? Even Draco himself was momentarily confused by the claim. However, John clarified his point, adding a layer of insight that Lucius had not considered. In Draco's eyes, I see a genuine desire for self-improvement. Lucius, you're overlooking a rare quality in your son, akin to a pearl hidden in the dust. Lucius was prompted to reassess his perception of his son. The notion of Draco possessing such a quality, the drive for self-improvement, was something he hadn't fully appreciated. John's words not only challenged Lucius's understanding of his son, but also highlighted a valuable trait that Lucius had failed to nurture. Chapter 105 The Black Dog and Tom Lucius Malfoy scrutinized the scene before him, yet he failed to perceive what John had suggested. Unperturbed, John continued, he will become a formidable wizard, independent of his lineage. His own merits will be his legacy, one that will fill you with pride. John's words were generous, for compliments cost nothing to give. His voice, low and raspy, carried the weight of ancient tales, reminiscent of a troubadour from bygone eras. He is destined to chase after someone, a person who will alter the course of everything. Like a beacon in the night sky, he will illuminate the entire magical world. Draco Malfoy felt a stir within him at these words, 
the image of John vivid in his mind. John's gaze, penetrating and insightful, seemed to pierce through Draco's soul as he posed a significant question. Son, will you choose to follow this individual, or will you live your life shielded by others? Caught in a tumult of emotions, Draco finally declared with conviction, I'm sorry, Mr. Johnny Silverhand, but I already have someone I've chosen to follow. He may not possess your strength, but he is worthy of my loyalty. Lucius, taken aback by his son's words, feared a misunderstanding. However, John raised a hand to forestall any response from Lucius. Approaching Draco, John spoke with an air of mystery. I look forward to seeing this unfold. The intensity of the moment compelled Draco to take a deep breath, to which he solemnly nodded. That day will come. John, satisfied with Draco's resolve, decided there was no need to pursue the matter of godfatherhood further. To divert Lucius from any dark thoughts, John presented several letters. These are invitations from pure-blood families to Hogwarts. You will reclaim your position on the Hogwarts Board of Governors before Christmas this year. Lucius's spirits lifted at the prospect of regaining his former status. However, John added a stipulation. You must restrain from meddling excessively in Hogwarts affairs. This position is merely a title. Lucius's expectations were dashed, his face clouding over. John's gaze, deep and commanding, met Lucius's. You must learn contentment. Remember, the person you've antagonized is hailed as the most powerful headmaster in Hogwarts history. John's admonition struck a chord with Lucius, reminding him of Dumbledore's formidable reputation, a man who had contended with dark lords across generations. Lucius, conceding internally, recognized the necessity for the Malfoys to adopt a more subdued approach. After Lucius and Draco departed, John remained in contemplation. Lucius seems unaware of Voldemort's current predicament, he mused. Given Voldemort's weakened state, it was unlikely he could rally his followers, as he once did. This ignorance was advantageous to John, who admitted to having gaps in his memory regarding certain events. Regardless, we'll face whatever comes. Harry and Dumbledore will handle what lies ahead, John resolved, pushing these concerns aside. Casting a disillusionment charm on himself, John departed Johnny Silverhands. Reaching a secluded spot, he used apparition to return home, his skill in the magical art improving with each journey. Upon arriving, John noticed Tom's absence. Basil, where's Tom? he inquired. Basil, dozing in his designated spot, opened one eye lazily and glanced towards the window. Approaching, John observed his own dog, Basil, alongside a large black stray dog they had encountered previously. I was envious last time, but today we played together, Basil seemed to convey through his relaxed demeanor. This chapter not only advances the plot, but also deepens the character development, particularly of Draco Malfoy, showcasing his loyalty and the choices that define him. John's mysterious aura and his interactions with the Malfoys hint at larger forces at play, setting the stage for future events in this magical world. John watched with a mix of amusement and concern as his small dog, Tom, struggled to keep up with the long strides of the large, black dog that had recently started visiting. The size difference between the two was comical, yet somehow they had formed a close bond. John mused, could it be because they're both male? He glanced at the black dog, noting its size, especially its long legs, and then back at Tom, remembering that Tom was female. Well, Tom, a relationship between you two seems unlikely, especially considering the size difference, he thought, somewhat disheartened by the thought of his dog's unrequited affection. John couldn't help but wonder if this was a peculiar case of love, where a handsome, long-legged stray dog had captured the heart of his pampered pet. Let them enjoy their time together, he decided, knowing that soon he would be off to school and Tom would likely forget her distant admirer. With a shake of his head, he turned his attention away from the canine companions. Meanwhile, Sirius Black, in his animagus form of a large black dog, was hiding in Privet Drive, evading the Ministry of Magic and the Dementors. He was consumed with thoughts of revenge against Peter Pettigrew, the friend who had betrayed him and their other friends, leading to Sirius's wrongful imprisonment in Azkaban. The sight of Tom, the small dog, brought back memories of simpler times, including the taste of small dried fish, a luxury compared to the scraps he had survived on since escaping Azkaban. Seeing Sirius drool at the memory, Tom quickly fetched a large bag of dog food, 
which, while not as delightful as dried fish, was a feast for Sirius. He devoured the food, finding pieces of jerky and steak among the kibble, a meal that nearly brought him to tears after years of hardship. John, observing the scene, couldn't help but draw parallels between his dog feeding Sirius and the stories of wealthy families secretly supporting their less fortunate relatives. I never expected you to be such a generous dog, he remarked, half-jokingly considering whether he should take measures to prevent Sirius from potentially causing trouble for other pets in the neighborhood. Deciding to let the matter rest for now, John focused on his own responsibilities, including dealing with the Monster Book of Monsters, a textbook chosen by Hagrid for his upcoming class on the conservation of magical zoology. As he calmed the book by stroking its spine, John reflected on Hagrid's vindication. After decades of being blamed for an incident caused by Voldemort, Hagrid's name had finally been cleared, allowing him to take up a teaching position at Hogwarts. John pondered the concept of justice, realizing that while it may eventually prevail, the time lost could never be reclaimed. Justice may be late, but is it truly justice if it arrives after so much time has passed, he thought, considering the years Hagrid had suffered due to a wrongful accusation. Despite everything, Hagrid's enthusiasm for teaching and his love for magical creatures remained undiminished, a testament to his resilient spirit. For fifty years, he had dedicated himself to the care of his beloved magical creatures. It was likely that Dumbledore was aware of this passion, which is why he decided to offer Hagrid compensation. Hagrid, who had never before held the title of professor, immediately thought of John. Given John's role as an assistant in the Defense Against the Dark Arts, Hagrid believed him to be highly experienced. However, upon reviewing the curriculum Hagrid had planned, John couldn't help but shake his head in disbelief. Forget about the blast-ended scroots and the like. Why can't we include some more appealing creatures? John lamented, feeling a twinge of discomfort. Hagrid, with his boundless affection for all magical creatures, failed to see them through the eyes of the students. To him, every creature was enchanting and beautiful, but John knew better. Creatures like the blast-ended scroots were far from endearing to most students. Thus, John found himself revising Hagrid's list, striving to include magical animals that would captivate and educate the students without causing undue e distress. After meticulously reworking the curriculum, John looked up, exhausted from the effort. To his surprise, he saw a massive balloon floating across the sky. The sight was unexpected and out of place, yet it captured his attention, pulling him momentarily away from the world of magical creatures and into the wonders of the sky above. Chapter 1-6 A Balloon in the Sky and the Dursley's Fear A worthless, lazy liar, a complete good-for-nothing. Aunt Marge's words were like venom. He is not. Harry's voice trembled with rage, defending his father against her slander. Have some more brandy. Uncle Vernon, sensing the escalating tension, hastily refilled Aunt Marge's glass with the remainder of the bottle. He then turned to Harry with a growl. Go to bed now. No, Vernon. Aunt Marge, having downed her brandy with a belch, fixed her small bloodshot eyes on Harry, her gaze seeming to taunt him. Go on, boy. You're very proud of your parents, aren't you? They were killed in a car crash. Unable to bear the lies any longer, Harry stood, his voice firm. They didn't die in a car accident. His words caused Uncle Vernon's face to blanch, and he gestured frantically for Marge to cease her provocations. However, Aunt Marge seemed unable to stop herself, her words growing more vitriolic, labeling Harry a burden and an ungrateful wretch. As she spoke, her body began to swell unnaturally, expanding like a balloon until she floated upwards. Uncle Vernon's scream of horror echoed as he attempted, in vain, to pull her down, nearly being lifted off the ground himself. The Dursleys were thrown into chaos, but Harry had no desire to stay. Grabbing his luggage, he made for the door in seconds. Uncle Vernon tried to intercept him, but Harry, wand in hand, warned, she's doing this to herself. Move. After Harry had stormed out, dragging his suitcase through the streets, his anger began to ebb, replaced by exhaustion and confusion. Leaning against a wall on Magnolia Crescent, he gasped for breath, overwhelmed by his predicament. Using magic outside of school could have severe consequences, possibly even Azkaban. 
Lost in his turmoil, he wondered if he would be forced to navigate the muggle world alone, a fugitive. His thoughts turned to Ron and Hermione, his steadfast friends who would surely stand by him, regardless of the circumstances. Yet, with Hedwig temporarily staying with Ron, Harry felt utterly isolated. Harry, there seems to be a lot of activity over there, a familiar voice broke through his despair. John emerged from the shadows, inexplicably holding a can of dried fish. Planning to run away from home? he inquired, raising an eyebrow at Harry's disheveled state. John, I, I might be wandering the world soon, Harry admitted, feeling a glimmer of hope upon seeing John, who lived nearby and had likely witnessed his good deed. John couldn't help but chuckle. Harry, you're the savior. Do you really think the Ministry of Magic would imprison you over something so trivial? Come on, you need to calm down. He set down the dried fish, offering a bit of comfort. Don't worry too much. Just find a safe place to wait, Aleth. The Ministry might just send you a letter. Suggesting that Harry could stay at the Leaky Cauldron for a while, John offered to help sort things out. Harry, feeling somewhat reassured, nodded in agreement. John then handed Harry a bag of galleons, noticing his stunned expression. Didn't you ask to borrow some money? Uh, that's a lot. At least a hundred galleons, Harry murmured, overwhelmed by John's generosity and the unexpected turn of events. Harry scratched his head and stammered, clearly uncomfortable. John, with a hint of amusement, quipped, with a veritable mountain of gold in your vault, are you really playing the pauper here? He tossed a galleon to Harry, which struck him in the chest, causing him to wince. Without another word, John turned and made his way to the Dursley's house, mindful of the need to conclude his business swiftly before any muggles noticed the spectacle unfolding in the sky. It was only after John had departed that Harry managed to catch his breath, the weight of the gold coin in his hand a tangible reminder of the encounter. Watching John's retreating figure, Harry felt an unexpected warmth in his heart. However, this feeling was quickly replaced by a shiver of apprehension as he sensed some hing ominous lurking in the shadows at the end of the street. Instinctively, he whispered, Lumos, and his wand cast a reassuring glow. Across the road, he spotted a large black dog, its size and demeanor reminiscent of a bear, which made Harry's heart race. In his attempt to get a better look, he stumbled and fell. Suddenly, the sound of galloping pierced the night, followed by a blinding light. Shielding his eyes, Harry glimpsed a purple, sigh, three-decker bus materializing before him. The conductor, a young man with notably large ears, hopped down and eyed Harry with suspicion. What are you doing on the ground? he inquired. Harry glanced back across the street, only to find that the black dog had vanished. Meanwhile, chaos reigned at the Dursley's house. Amidst the cacophony of screams and barking dogs, Maggie was seen floating perilously in the air until a snowy owl swooped in, skillfully grabbing her by the collar and bringing her safely to the ground. John approached the house and knocked, but the tumult inside suggested that no one would answer. Effortlessly, he waved his hand over the doorknob, which clicked open, allowing him entrance. The moment he stepped inside, the noise ceased as if muted. Vernon Dursley, red-faced and furious, began to berate John, but a single look from John silenced him. Maggie, still in a daze, was brought inside by Basil. The Dursleys, desperate, pleaded with John, Please, can you undo whatever has been done to her? John, with a slight smirk, responded, If you've learned anything from your muggle upbringing, it's that politeness goes a long way. Vernon, struggling to contain his anger, managed to choke out a request for help. With a nonchalant gesture from John, Maggie's condition was swiftly reversed, leaving her disoriented but physically unharmed. Just then, a loud noise announced the arrival of two Ministry of Magic officials. They were initially taken aback by the scene, but quickly focused on Maggie, who was still recovering from her ordeal. John, ever the charmer, addressed the officials, I believe there's a muggle here in need of your services to erase a rather distressing memory. He then casually suggested they reward his owl, Basil, with a couple of dried fish for its assistance, leaving the officials bemused by his audacity. Despite their confusion, the officials proceeded to erase Maggie's memory, much to the Dursley's horror, who feared the worst. Once the ministry representatives had departed, John remained, a calm presence amidst the storm he had helped quell. Perched on the sofa, 
Basil gracefully flew to his shoulder and settled there. He turned to Vernon Dursley with a smile that belied his youthful appearance, making him seem as formidable as the wealthiest and most influential figures. Now, Mr. Dursley, could you perhaps enlighten me as to why Harry is so upset? He inquired, his tone polite, yet carrying an undercurrent of authority that made Vernon swallow hard. Despite being evidently the same age as Harry, Basil exuded an aura that commanded respect and attention, much like those in positions of power. Chapter 107, Silver Hand's Angel Investment and the Call of Magic As the head of the family, Vernon Dursley stood up, his voice cautious. It's about Maggie. We inadvertently mentioned something concerning Harry's parents. Inadvertently? John's gaze was piercing, prompting Vernon to quickly amend his statement. Perhaps some unfortunate words were mixed in. Observing John's expression for signs of anger and finding none, Vernon was relieved. John sighed, understanding now why Harry had been so upset. In Harry's eyes, his parents were paragons of virtue. It was during today's heated moment that Harry, agitated, had unintentionally unleashed magic on Maggie. Remarkably, he had done so without a wand, which reinforced John's belief that magic was closely tied to emotions. Sitting on the sofa, John tapped his fingers thoughtfully on the armrest. The Dursleys watched in terror as the chaos they had caused seemed to be tidied away by unseen forces. John fixed Vernon with a meaningful look and said calmly, It appears you have a fundamental misunderstanding of wizards. Vernon, intimidated by John's penetrating gaze, remained silent. You seem to think wizards are akin to street magicians, mere tricksters, John continued, his voice cool. You're mistaken. A wizard could effortlessly demolish a house with a flick of his wand or send your car careening off a cliff. Vernon gasped, his voice trembling. But students aren't allowed to use magic outside of school, right? John's response was a chuckle. True, but that's not the whole story. Do you think someone ceases to be a wizard once they leave Hogwarts? Let me be clear, Mr. Dursley. I'm not trying to scare you unnecessarily. By antagonizing Harry, you're pushing him towards a dangerous path. Vernon felt a chill run down his spine. He had underestimated Harry's capabilities and the gravity of their situation. Today, had Harry been less in control, you might not have been here to see my arrival. Life is fragile. Why provoke a wizard, especially with such disdain? You could have been a supportive family. Petunia Dursley, upon hearing the word family, clutched Vernon's hand. Harry was her nephew, her sister's child. The loss of Harry's parents to Voldemort was also the loss of her sister. Despite her envy of her sister's magical abilities, Petunia had never intended to abandon Harry. John's words made her realize the gravity of her actions towards Harry. Vernon, drenched in cold sweat, recalled the fear he felt when Harry had pointed his wand at him earlier that day. That will be all, Mr. Dursley. What a disruption this has been, John concluded standing to leave now that the Dursleys understood the need to change their attitude towards Harry. On his way home, John encountered the large black dog again. Here again, after just feeding you dried fish, he muttered, placing the last piece of dried fish on the ground before the dog. After giving the dog a pat on the head, John continued on his way home. Sirius, in his animagus form, recognized John as Harry's ally. As he chewed on the dried fish, he pondered how to capture the traitor. With less than a month of summer vacation remaining, John gave a crystal ball a gentle push. It rolled off the table onto the floor. Tom, eager to help, rushed to retrieve it. It seems the enthusiasm of our young wizard knows no bounds, John mused, eyeing a stack of letters on the table addressed to the generous Lord Johnny Silverhand. Having already committed to covering the expenses for a cursed young wizard's wolfsbane potion until he came of age, John noted that more than half of the Little Wizard Foundation's funds were still available. With a considerable sum amassed from the profits of Lockhart's books and the continuous revenue from the Johnny Silverhand store, John decided it was time to put the surplus to good use. Johnny Silverhand, leveraging his wealth, established a unique opportunity to support the entrepreneurial dreams of young wizards. By offering angel investment, he addressed the common issue of lacking startup capital among aspiring wizard entrepreneurs. His stores across the country received a steady stream of letters, prompting Johnny to designate a special mailbox for these correspondences. Among the letters, 
one from Fred and George Weasley, caught his attention. Known for their inventive minds, the twins proposed opening a joke store. Johnny, intrigued, replied with interest but insisted on evaluating their products first, despite their shared classmate status. Before sending his response, Johnny remembered the Weasley twins were currently in Egypt. Deciding to wait for their return, he set the letter aside and sifted through the others. A photo from Hermione in Paris caught his eye, though the darkness of the image made him question the camera angle. Another letter from Dharma Alex revealed his keen interest in Johnny's last research proposal. Eager to share his findings, Dharma invited Johnny to Belby Manor. Upon arrival, Johnny was greeted by a house elf and introduced to a visibly exhausted Dharma, whose dedication to his work was evident from his smoke-emitting ears and dark circles under his eyes. Dharma's excitement was palpable as he showed Johnny his breakthrough on the blood curse, a millennia-old affliction. He had developed a potion, similar in preparation to the Wolfsbane potion, due to the lack of specific test subject. Johnny, examining the potion, noted its foul stench and the ominous scarlet color. He expressed more interest in the hereditary aspect of the curse, pointing out the unique challenge it presented compared to other forms of magic. As Dharma's exhaustion finally overtook him, leading him to fall asleep mid-conversation, Johnny contemplated finding a place to wait. Suddenly, his surroundings transformed into a dense forest, and a mysterious voice beckoned him. A figure flashed before his eyes, and Johnny felt as though he was being pulled into an apparition passage. Amidst the disorienting experience, he glimpsed lines of silver light, hinting at an unforeseen adventure ahead. This unexpected turn of events promised to delve deeper into the mysteries of magic and the unexplored territories that lay beyond the familiar walls of the wizarding world. Johnny's journey was about to take a new, thrilling direction, guided by the mysterious call of the unknown. Hovering before him, John grasped the ethereal line with all his might, only to find himself plummeting suddenly. The visions that had enveloped him vanished, replaced by the familiar surroundings of Belby Manor. Leaning heavily against the table, John gasped for air, his gaze fixated on his right hand. A silver, light-like line extended from his palm, disappearing into the void at its other end. Who was that just now? John murmured, perplexed. It felt as though he had physically touched something moments before. Glancing down, he discovered a book in his hand. Upon closer inspection, he realized that the open page detailed a blood curse. Simultaneously, he noticed an enhancement in his proficiency with ancient magic. As John contemplated his newfound mastery, the voice he had heard earlier lingered in his mind. It bore a resemblance to the enchantments used by goblins, yet there was something uniquely compelling about it. Could it be ancient magic? He pondered, his fingers gently caressing the page that spoke of the blood curse. The look in John's eyes shifted, reflecting a newfound determination. The call he had experienced was undoubtedly from the realm of ancient magic, carrying with it a sorrowful, feminine timber. This warrants investigation, John resolved, his grip on the ethereal line firming. However, he realized that the source of the call lay beyond the nation's borders, in a place shrouded in mystery. Chapter 108, Albania and the Source of the Call After the silver light line left the palm of his hand, it retracted in one direction. John grasped it firmly again, but the line remained stationary in his palm, exerting a faint pulling force. It's guiding me, John mused. Without further delay, he left Belby Manor and used apparition. At the moment of apparition, John felt the strength of the line in his hand intensify. He undertook an extremely dangerous action by allowing the line to pull him instead of apparating by his own will. This sensation was extraordinary. John's body was continuously compressed and elongated. Gradually, he found himself being drawn into the lines, shuttling at high speed while enduring the pain of this acceleration. Suddenly, there was an explosion, and John, radiating silver light, fell to the ground. The silver light line in his hand gradually dissipated as he surveyed his surroundings. I am certain that I have entered a country illegally, he thought observing the wild and untamed environment that confirmed his suspicion of being in a remote location. The dense virgin forest enveloped him. Using apparition for the first time for long-distance teleportation, John was overwhelmed by a wave of nausea 
and retched a few times. After regaining his composure, John's attention was drawn to a distinctive three-pronged tree similar to one he had seen in his vision. He approached it cautiously, his pupils dilating as he noticed grains of chaotic elemental fluctuations on the tree. Could this be ancient magic? He wondered. Confirming the absence of danger, John reached out to touch the chaotic particles, which suddenly transformed into a snake and bit his palm. He quickly withdrew his hand, noticing a dark wound that was barely visible. These particles are very aggressive, he noted. After experimenting for a while, John conjured a ball of water from his fingertips, enveloping the chaotic particles. It seems only fey magic, another form of ancient magic, can tame them. He encapsulated three particles in three water droplets, which danced around on his hand. Grasping one, John whispered, Show me the way. To his surprise, the drop of water pointed in a specific direction within his palm. Following this new guide, John navigated through the increasingly dense underbrush, occasionally encountering strange magical creatures that scurried away. Hagrid would be delighted to be here, he thought, kicking away a red cap that attempted to attack his knee. After the last drop of water exploded, signaling the depletion of its magic, John continued on his path. Nearly an hour later, he arrived at a wooden cabin shrouded in darkness. After a moment's consideration, John cast a disillusionment charm on himself and approached the cabin, where he heard unsettling sounds from within. The hissing and spitting resembled that of a boa constrictor, accompanied by a chilling sucking noise. Nagini, John realized, recalling the last time he heard such a voice, was in the Chamber of Secrets during his first year at Hogwarts. It was a hoarse and cold voice, reminiscent of stones rubbing against each other in the cold of winter. John instinctively tightened his grip on his wand as he quietly moved closer to the cabin, which appeared to have been abandoned by its original owner, likely now reduced to bones. Inside, he saw Voldemort, the Dark Lord who had once terrorized the wizarding world, lying atop a twelve-foot snake, appearing as a deformed creature reliant on venom for sustenance. Voldemort's current state of weakness sparked a sudden, overwhelming urge in John. Kill him! The thought surged through him like a flood breaking through a dam. John had previously defeated Quirrell, who was possessed by Voldemort, and the memory of Tom Riddle. Despite his past victories, John hesitated, questioning whether he could truly end Voldemort in his current state. In an effort to alter the course of history and prevent the numerous battles that might unfold at Hogwarts, John found himself contemplating a drastic act, Ion. His mind was a whirlwind of uncontrollable thoughts as he stared intently at the figure before him. Wand at the ready, he was poised to cast a killing curse or unleash fiend fire, aiming to consign the Dark Lord to the annals of history as mere dust. As the future White Demon King, Johnny Silverhand, and a recipient of the Merlin First Class Medal, he believed his actions would benefit the magical world. Visions of various futures danced through his mind. With his heart racing, John raised his wand, aiming it at the figure. Just as he was about to act, a sudden realization struck him. Fiend fire, he shouted decisively. The red flames roared to life, engulfing the entire log cabin in an instant. He watched as Voldemort's angry roars filled the air, and the large snake, Nagini, attempted to escape, only to be surrounded by the fiend fire. The flames transformed into a fire dragon, diving towards the cabin window. However, upon contact with a barrier, the fire morphed into a green flaming viper that turned and attacked John instead. Sweat beaded on John's forehead as he witnessed his potential fate, and all previous thoughts vanished from his mind. There's a super advanced rebound spell on it, he realized in terror. Had he proceeded with his initial plan, he would have undoubtedly been injured by the rebound spell. He also recognized that his state of mind had been compromised, similar to how Harry was influenced by the diary. Calmly retreating, John narrowly avoided falling into the Dark Lord's trap, grateful for his foresight. Once at a safe distance, John's gaze remained fixed on the cabin. His pupils dilated as he observed chaotic particles emanating from the wooden structure. Are these particles related to Voldemort? He wondered. Although he didn't recall Voldemort being versed in ancient magic, it wouldn't be surprising given his status as the Dark Lord. Upon closer inspection, John realized the particles were not emanating from Voldemort but from Nagini. 
Nagini. I remember Neville later destroyed it as a horcrux, he mused. As he focused on the large snake, a voice reached him. I'm here, help me. The voice was laden with sadness, sorrow, and pain. Surprised, John looked at Nagini, noticing nothing unusual. The voice seemed to emanate from within the snake, as if someone was trapped inside. Could this be Voldemort's magic, or... John recalled hearing the call only after interacting with a book about the blood curse. He speculated that Nagini might be a victim of the blood curse, which transformed humans into snakes, granting them animagus-like powers while also subjecting them to a backlash. The origin of the blood curse is ancient, possibly ancient magic, John pondered. If his theory was correct, Nagini's original form might have been human. Knowing that Nagini would become, or perhaps already was, one of Voldemort's horcruxes, John faced a dilemma in attempting to rescue the snake. Should I seek help? He briefly considered, only to dismiss the idea. Unsure of his location and the feasibility of returning, he realized he was alone against Voldemort, a formidable adversary. It's not in my nature to walk away from a piece of ancient magic, John thought, torn between his options. He decided to wait for an opportunity, reasoning that Nagini would eventually leave the cabin to hunt or serve Voldemort. If I don't act within a week, I'll leave, he resolved, setting a deadline for himself. In the meantime, John prepared for a lengthy vigil, thankful for the provisions he had brought along in his small bag. In the original context, the passage seems to describe a makeshift solution for sustenance, likely within the magical world of Harry Potter. To enhance the clarity and quality of the text, the revised version might read, The container, once filled with fish and various other items, had been primarily used to feed the owls. Now, however, it had found a new purpose as a source of rations. This revision corrects grammatical errors, improves sentence structure for better readability, and adds a bit of detail to make the imagery clearer. It also ensures that the actions described are logical within the context, assuming a situation where resources are being repurposed for survival or practical needs. Chapter 109, Capturing the Orochi and a Time for Dialogue. Time is an enigma, it slips by unnoticed, yet occasionally it seems to stretch on indefinitely. After three restless days at the cabin, John found himself unable to remain idle any longer. An incessant urge gnawed at him, compelling him to consider casting fiend fire or a shattering curse on the cabin, as if an invisible force was relentlessly prodding him to act. This is truly vexing, he muttered, his lips curling in annoyance. To distract himself, John immersed himself in his studies, occasionally casting a disillusionment charm on himself for practice. On the sixth day, his patience was rewarded when he finally spotted the giant serpent emerging from the cabin. He watched intently as it slithered away, calculating the distance between them. This distance isn't sufficient, he thought. To launch an effective attack, he needed to be within ten steps of the serpent, all the while ensuring he remained outside the cabin's protective spell range. John tapped his wand against a tree trunk, casting a super-sensory spell that extended a hundred meters around him. This spell ensured that no disturbance, no matter how minor, could escape his notice. He waited silently for the serpent to move beyond the cabin's protective range, noting the chaotic particles that lingered in its wake. These particles, ephemeral in nature, seemed to be more concentrated within the serpent's body. With a soft exhale, John conjured a mist, reminiscent of the hazy aftermath of rain that silently enveloped the forest. Concealed within this magical fog, he relied on his supersensory spell to track the serpent's movements, even as his own vision was obscured. He followed the serpent, which seemed unbothered by the mist, familiar with the path it had traversed countless times. Along the way, the serpent consumed a stray rabbit, fur and all, showcasing a ferocity that starkly contrasted with the delicate, miserable voice John had heard before. John continued his silent pursuit until they reached a three-pronged tree, a landmark he recognized from his first visit. The serpent's diet seemed indiscriminate, consuming small animals and even a red hat without hesitation. Its occasional hisses were unintelligible to John, who lacked the ability to understand parcel tongue. This should be far enough, John thought, calculating the distance. Even if Voldemort were to discover them now, he wouldn't be able to close the gap quickly. 
John carefully donned a pair of anti-curse gloves and retrieved a bottle of black powder from his bag, a gift from Quirrell intended for a darker purpose. The powder, derived from unicorn horn, was capable of inducing a deep slumber in its victims. With meticulous care, John used wind magic to direct the powder towards the serpent. The powder, nearly invisible to the naked eye, required a keen insight to be seen. As the powder made contact with the serpent, Voldemort, lurking within the cabin, sensed the intrusion. Someone has found Nagini, he realized in alarm. No. Voldemort's realization came too late as he witnessed Nagini succumb to the powder's effects. In a desperate attempt, he unleashed a powerful curse towards John, who glanced towards the cabin just in time to see the curse barreling towards him. Reacting swiftly, John dove to the serpent's side and, grasping its tail, used apparition to escape. The two vanished with a pop, moments before the curse struck, leaving a crater in its wake. Voldemort's furious roar echoed through the cabin, its lethal intensity killing any nearby animals. Outside Belby Manor, there was a loud crack as John and the giant serpent reappeared. John's face was pale. His apparition, only at level two, was not suited for such long-distance travel. Traveling with a snake had indeed exhausted him. Moreover, the cry he heard from Voldemort as he was leaving struck his soul, feeling as though it was squeezing his head. As expected of the second-generation Dark Lord, his strength is formidable. Even without a magic wand, he poses a great danger, he thought, his expression filled with apprehension. John couldn't help but think of Tom Riddle, the young version of Voldemort. Even in his fifth year, Riddle had demonstrated the strength of an auror. It was difficult for John to imagine how powerful Voldemort was at his peak. Perhaps, if not for Dumbledore, Voldemort might have conquered the wizarding world long ago. After narrowly escaping death, John, despite his experience in battle, felt his heart racing. He grabbed the tail of the large snake and dragged it to Belby Manor. Dharma Alex was feeling somewhat dejected. He had just fallen asleep, but upon waking, found John gone. They had agreed to share their achievements, so why had John taken the prize and left? This thought panicked Dharma Alex. To him, losing his honor was worse than death itself. I better act first and release it in advance so he can't take it from me, Dharma Alex thought. Although his blood demon potion hadn't been tested yet, he began writing in order to preserve his honor. After several revisions, just as he was about to publish his results, John returned. Dharma Alex, do you have a dungeon or something similar here? It would be ideal if it were enchanted, John inquired, looking quite peculiar. His hair was tangled with grass roots and leaves, and his clothes were damp with dew, despite the absence of rain. But what caught Dharma Alex's attention most was the twelve-foot snake John was dragging into the manor, its condition unclear. John, what have you done? Dharma Alex momentarily forgot the letter in his hand. He watched as John returned and immediately wanted to follow and ask where he had been. However, John didn't give him the chance, so Dharma Alex reluctantly led him to the Belby family's dungeon. After throwing the large snake inside, John also cast enchantment spells on the dungeon. Phew, it's finally ready. Now we have the material for our experiment, John said, pretending to wipe non-existent sweat from his brow. He glanced at Dharma Alex, who had donned a cloak and switched to a more luxurious cane, and was about to leave. Are you going out? Uh, I'm not in a hurry, Dharma Alex replied, tucking away the letter with a guilty conscience. Recalling John's earlier words, he exclaimed in surprise, You just mentioned experimental materials. John asked the house elf to prepare a cup of thick, sweet hot chocolate for him. He nodded casually and said, Yes, this is a patient afflicted with a blood curse. What? Dharma Alex, initially intending to question John further, was suddenly intrigued. He was not even deterred by the possibility of the sleeping snake waking up and rushed into the dungeon. He examined the large snake closely, eager to study this rare blood curse patient. I suspect that this blood cursed being has undergone a transformation, but it seems her soul has been somewhat preserved. We can start our investigation from there. John explained, taking a sip of the thick, sweet hot chocolate the house elf had respectfully handed him. He might not have enjoyed such a sweet beverage before, but now he savored it eagerly. The warm chocolate seemed to revive his pale complexion. Why is this large snake sleeping so soundly? 
Dharma Alex noticed something odd about the snake. Despite his loud movements, it showed no signs of waking. John finished his hot chocolate quickly and replied nonchalantly, Oh, I used a method similar to a sleeping spell. It will probably sleep for a few months. How many months? Dharma Alex pressed for details. John coughed twice, slightly embarrassed, and admitted, About two or three months. You cast the sleeping curse on it dozens of times, didn't you? Dharma Alex deduced, realizing the extent of John's actions. Alex was taken aback. If we use dozens of sleeping spells, even a fire dragon would slumber eternally. It's also John's first time employing black unicorn powder, so it's understandable that he might struggle with controlling the dosage. He stated confidently, This situation is actually ideal. It presents us with an opportunity to conduct a test. Dharma Alex also realized the potential benefits. Given the size of the serpent, it was clear it wasn't going to be easy to handle. Testing it while it was unconscious might indeed simplify matters. John felt a wave of relief wash over him upon seeing Alex come around to his point of view. At that moment, a silver thread of light appeared before John's eyes, causing him to pause in surprise. The thread seemed to be connected to the serpent. As he reached out to touch it, a voice filled with sorrow and gentleness echoed, Help me, end my suffering. The voice carried a tone of desperation. John took a moment to consider his response before replying, I'm doing everything I can. His words traveled along the silver thread to the serpent, and it seemed as though the voice's owner had heard him. A note of disbelief tinged her voice. Can you really hear me? Yes, so please hold on. I'm doing my best to free you from this curse, John replied, his voice softening. It appeared that the voice was able to reach him, because the serpent was under the spell of sleep. Every blood-cursed being was a living tragedy, doomed through no fault of their own. Trust me, John said with conviction. Despite the youthfulness of his voice, there was an undeniable sincerity that inspired confidence. Nagini, the serpent with a soul on the brink of shattering, found a glimmer of hope and spoke again. Who are you? John Wick, he answered. As he spoke, the silver thread in his hand disintegrated and drifted towards the serpent. Their conversation came to an end. John watched the fragments of silver light in his hand, reminiscent of a broken soul. The moment was dreamlike, filled with a poignant sense of loss and hope intertwined. Chapter 110 The Road to Redemption and the Countdown to the Beginning of School Notification Mission Triggered The Road to Redemption Reward Any Skill Point Plus One blessing of the soul walker. The system presented a redemption mission to break the blood curse, which significantly heightened John's concern for the matter. On August 21st, he suggested, let's add some fire ash snake eggs and test the blood magic potion this time. Despite knowing the difficulty of breaking an ancient curse, the challenge proved even more formidable than anticipated. John, with a casual toss of his coat to the house elf, watched as Dharma Alex drank a pick-me-up, causing the smoke from his ears to turn black. Together, they administered the improved blood demon potion to the sleeping giant snake. Despite their hopeful anticipation, the snake showed no change. Failed again, Dharma Alex declared, collapsing warily into a chair. The usual attention he paid to etiquette and demeanor vanished as he scratched his thinning hair and crossed out the formula on the parchment. John, sipping a large mouthful of thick, sweet chocolate, looked tired and remarked, It's not just the physical changes, the patient's soul has also been eroded. Do you suggest starting with the soul, John? The soul is a big taboo, Dharma Alex responded, looking at John with a mix of seriousness and concern. Throughout history, those mad dark wizards who delved into the study of the soul were all evil incarnate, and none met a good end. I'm aware, Dharma Alex. You should know this isn't an easy path, John replied, rubbing his brows wearily. I've always believed that there's no such thing as evil magic, only evil wizards. I don't want to see you stray from the right path. We're partners and friends, Dharma Alex said, standing up with difficulty. His body was emaciated, almost as if his skin was stretched over his bones. He then reactivated the dungeon's enchantment with a key from the wall. Exiting the dungeon, John was greeted by the sunset. Another day had passed in their relentless pursuit. I fear I won't be able to accompany you much longer, my friend, he mused, with the start of school looming. 
Aside from the books sent by Hagrid, John had made no other preparations. In recent days, he occasionally glimpsed a silver thread visible only to him. Dharma Alex, upon inquiry, saw nothing and could not interact with it, leading him to wonder if John was deluding himself. It seems only those versed in ancient magic can perceive it, John concluded, lost in thought. He had communicated with the spirit within the serpent, learning her name was Nagini. It's a truly vile curse, altering the body, changing the species, and destroying the soul, John reflected, horrified at the thought of the curse's creator's genius and malevolence. It felt like a chess game against an ancient entity, with the curse seemingly insurmountable. Nagini's time is running short. I must find something to fortify her soul, John resolved, aware of the increasing fragmentation of Nagini's soul, and uncertain if she would survive the year. His thoughts turned to unicorn horns, wondering if their reputed power could also mend a soul. Let's try it, he decided, his bond with Nagini deepening as he learned more about her tragic background. She was a victim of a blood curse passed down from her mother, who had raised her in a circus. Leaving Belby Manor, John sought rest, though he found little solace in sleep. Despite only needing two hours of sleep, he chose to linger in bed a while longer. Awakening the next day, he had slept until noon, a rarity for him. He picked up a copy of the Daily Prophet, which featured an article on Sirius Black's continued evasion of capture. Rita Skeeter's sensationalist reporting criticized the Azkaban Guard's negligence while lauding the Auror's efforts. Indeed, reading her articles is like drinking the bitterest coffee for a jolt of awareness, John mused, setting aside the newspaper with a mix of amusement and disdain. Rita Skeeter, known for her penchant for sensational journalism, certainly didn't make her statements without a purpose. She understood that visibility was key to establishing credibility. Given that Rufus Scrimger had become an ally, John was more than willing to lend his support. This particular incident significantly boosted Scrimger's profile. He appeared in numerous interviews, promising the swift capture of Sirius Black and asserting his readiness to take decisive action when necessary. Scrimger's firm stance quickly endeared him to the public, who found his interviews far more compelling than those of Cornelius Fudge, whose tendency to evade responsibility was well known. After adjusting his appearance, John considered a different mode of transportation for the day. Stepping outside, he summoned the night bus with a wave of his wand. The bright purple, triple-decker bus arrived promptly, and after paying the fare, John boarded. The bus navigated through streets and alleys with remarkable agility, showcasing its magical capabilities. John mused that it likely contained more enchantments than Mr. Weasley's car, though its ride was far from smooth. Inside, a wizard attempting to drink water ended up dousing himself due to the bus's erratic movements. John thought it fortunate that the beverage wasn't hot chocolate, sparing the wizard a rather unpleasant facial treatment. Upon reaching the leaky cauldron, John made his way into Diagon Alley. The bustling street, with its array of wizarding shops and crooked buildings, was as lively as ever. He noticed Florin Fusco's ice cream shop doing brisk business with its latest offering, a tomato and scrambled egg flavor inspired by the mysterious Orient. John was hesitant to try it, observing that it seemed to appeal more to older wizards than the younger generation, despite the presence of a few Hufflepuff students. Passing a Quidditch boutique, John's attention was caught by a display featuring the latest Firebolt broomstick. With the Quidditch World Cup approaching, the timing of its release was impeccable, though the price was only available upon inquiry. The shopkeeper boasted of an order from the Irish International Quidditch team, prompting John to consider the lucrative nature of broomstick sales. In the crowd, John spotted a familiar figure, but lost sight of it before he could approach. Arriving at Lyon Bookstore, he was greeted by the prominently displayed I Swing the Great Sword at Hogwarts and a special offer on Gilderoy Lockhart's complete book series, complete with an autographed photo. The promotion was a hit, especially among witches eager for Lockhart's signature. John watched the scene unfold with amusement, silently encouraging the enthusiastic purchases. Inside, John observed the bookstore clerk, who looked utterly defeated beside a cage of biting monster books of monsters. 
It was clear that Hagrid's choice of textbook had left the clerk wishing never to see another copy. Fortunately, Hagrid had already provided John with his own copy, allowing him to purchase the rest of his textbooks without incident, including those for the divination class. Upon exiting the bookstore, John noticed Harry Potter, now surrounded by an enthusiastic crowd. With a sympathetic smile, John mused, Poor Harry, I hope he grows taller in the future. John, towering with pride, watched with a hint of sympathy as Harry was jostled by the crowd. By chance, he stumbled upon the Lion Bookstore, which was hosting a special event. It was also time for John to purchase a new school uniform. His rapid growth spurt had rendered his current one embarrassingly short. After securing his new uniform, John's attention was captured by a shop adorned with a large glass display window. Inside, a magnificent galaxy model encased in a glass orb commanded his gaze. He stood outside, mesmerized, and mused, Hermione's birthday is just around the corner. She might cherish this as a gift. The price tag, however, gave him pause. Despite not being financially constrained, John couldn't help but balk at the cost. Nevertheless, he ventured inside and made the purchase, convinced of its worth as a present for Hermione. With the galaxy model in hand, John exited Diagon Alley and with a swift motion apparated back home. The start of the school term was only ten days away, and there was much to prepare for. Yet in that moment, John felt a warm satisfaction in finding a thoughtful gift for his friend, a small beacon of light in the bustling chaos of their magical world.